So what I'll do now is introduce uh, John Azuma, and then um, after his talk, we will actually introduce uh, Professor Yaku. So John gave me a really lengthy description of himself, um, so long that I, I, I almost can't remember it. I think he said, I am John Azuma. I'm the executive director of the Sunny Institute, and that's how he wanted to be introduced. So uh, we'll we'll leave it at that. So John, we'll we'll let you take off with this conversation. Thank you, thank you, Mike, and uh, for partnership and for friendship over the years and all the work you've done in Africa here, going back with Lamin and some of us for a number of years. Thank you, and we're glad to also see a lot of familiar faces here. Larry was with me and. Uh, in Jos 2018, and uh, we survived this lecture together at the University of Jos. La Larry was the only white guy in the whole room, which was hot, and I was so concerned. <laughs> but uh, it, it went on very well. This is a very important topic. We cannot shy away from it. It's in the minds of people and uh, a lot of questions. Uh, some of you stayed to uh, tar the whole of Islam. Boko Haram represents Islam, uh, and many have also said that Boko Haram has nothing to do with Islam. In fact, some have suggested that it is an invention of the CIA. So all kinds of conspiracy theories also there. But we thought this is an important topic to address, especially for our West African uh, region. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad I've got my colleague here from Nigeria who will be doing this with me. So. I am going to share a screen and I'm going to speak to this topic basically from uh, the point of view of just the historical and the intellectual context and roots of Boko Haram. And then I will leave the honorable task to my colleague to answer the question whether it is Islamic or it is not Islamic. I said, she is a Muslim. She is more than qualified to answer that question. So I will give an overview of the historical and the intellectual context for the rise of Boko Haram. So let me share my screen and then we will uh, get going. So Boko Haram, an Islamic or terrorist group. To understand this group, I want to start from a scholar who has done a lot of studies on the history of Islam in Nigeria. He's called Marie Lass. Uh, Prof. Lass is with the uh, London uh, University College, and he is one of the premier uh, historians of the Sokoto uh, Caliphate, which we will come to shortly. Uh, and in discussing Boko Haram, this is what Marie Lass had to say. He said that the rise of Boko Haram is best understood in the wider context of a pattern of dissent and factionalism in Northern Nigerian Islam that goes back at least 200 years and has a logic to it. It fits in what he says, a pattern of dissent, protests, divisions, sectionalism, if you like, factionalism, sectarianism. Uh, and he says that if you have to understand Boko Haram in that context, it did not just arise from a vacuum. He said that this is particular to Northern Nigerian Islam, and that this goes back uh, at least 200 years. This whole tradition of protest dissent goes back about 200 years, uh, and that it is in that context that we should understand the rise of Boko Haram. And I think that is very important to understand that. A Roman Catholic scholar of Islam in Nigeria, also Joseph Kenny, uh, has observed that Northern Nigerian Islam has been firmly reformist and separatist with regards to anything non-Islamic. Apart from the pattern of dissent and protest that is so characteristic of Northern Nigerian Islam, one other characteristic of Northern Nigerian Islam is the separatist kind of tendency with regards to anything non-Islamic. This kind of tendency to uh, reform, purify uh, Islam, from what is called bidah. So this whole idea of bidah, innovation, uh, uh, satanic innovation, syncretism. Northern Nigerian Islam has been very sensitive to that. And that is that is what Joseph Kenneth is saying also. And Boko Haram fits into these two patterns, dissent and reform, and both go together. If you look at the Boko Haram, therefore, there are what I call two competing schools of thought in the historical annals of Northern Nigerian Islam in particular. 
curriculum. Uh, and these are just my own inventions. Two competing schools of thought uh, is what uh, some scholars have described as the Suwerian tradition started by one uh, 13th century Muslim cleric called Al-Haji Salam Suwari. Uh, some think that his time was a little bit later than 13th century and others insist it's 13th century. But his school of thought is a kind of a school of thought within Islam that adopted religious learning and teaching as a vocation. And the Manding or the Mandinka ethnic group of West Africa are those who subscribe to this school of thought for many centuries. So in their understanding of Islam, they drew a distinction between a professional religious class, the warrior class, and the political class. And these three classes, they try to keep this compartmentalized. You were either a religious class, like the clerics, where you study and your vocation is Islamic learning, or you were in the warrior class. Most of the warrior class were not even Muslims. They were the indigenous native uh, people who were warriors. And then you had the ruling class or the political class. So this was their philosophy, that these spheres, religion, war, politics, should be kept distinct and separate from each other. And so with that philosophy, they lived and, and as minority Muslims in the midst of a majority traditional rulers right across West Africa. They traded with them and they lived with them and they had no problem living with non-Muslims, even under non-Muslim rule. The clerics kept political class at arm's length. They resisted the temptation to assume political office and avoided the direct interference and control by rulers. They also formed a pact with political leaders. Rulers would not enter the centers except on pre-arranged schedule and for the purpose of undertaking religious exercises. So that politicians do not just walk into these clerical centers. You have to pre-arrange and you must only be coming there for a religious exercise. Again, they were very wary of drawing too close to the political class and to the ruling classes. They kept their distance. And according to Lamin Sane, they adopted a scrupulous and principled disavowal of jihad as an instrument of religious and political change. This was significant for those Jahanke communities living in the 19th century when jihads reached epidemic proportions. So Professor Sane, the late Professor Sane, describes this school of thought or this tradition, the Sowerian tradition, as a pacifist tradition. Uh, and he makes an argument that the Sowerian tradition is, is pacifist, they eschewed jihad, they eschewed violence as a means of propagating Islam or even as an instrument for political change. And they stood up against uh, these kinds of tendencies within West African Islam. So this is the first school of thought. And as I said, this was a school that was dominant in West Africa for centuries, right from, if you like, the, the 11th century right down to the 18th, 19th century. This was the school of thought that predominated, with Muslims living uh, under traditional rulers as minorities, serving in the traditional courts and traders as clerics and as religious advisors and chaplains to, to rulers. Then we had what we call, I call the Magillian school of thought. Abdul Karim al Magili is a 15th, 16th century Algerian scholar who left Algeria under very uh, difficult circumstances and traveled throughout Sub Saharan Africa, West Africa in particular. Uh, and he left North Africa at a time that the Crusaders were reconquering Spain with Muslim refugees flooding into North Africa. And so the idea of Christians and Jews uh, kind of animated this guy. So his views were kind of uh, conceived in that, against that backdrop of the reconquista of Spain. So he had very negative things about non-Muslims, especially Jews and Christians. And his views led to pogroms of Jews in North Africa uh, as he called for Jews to be killed, and uh, he was expelled by the rulers, and he left as an itinerant scholar and traveled in West Africa. And that is where his views became very much received and later were, were invoked, uh, which we shall see later. Uh, he cites a host of Quranic verses and traditions, and he concludes that every true believer must be severe against unbelievers. For, in his words, it is one of the signs of love of the prophet that we should hate those who are hated by God or the prophet and become hostile to those who are enemies of God and the prophet. So, 
In contrast to the Suwerian who lived with non-Muslims, traded with them, accepted hospitality from them, for al magili this was not acceptable. You don't enter into those kinds of relationships with non-Muslims. You've got to be severe with them, as he says. Fighting and killing rulers who did not enforce the Sharia, along with their supporters in the west of al magili is permissible, even if they pray, fast, and pay zakat, and perform the pilgrimage. In other words, Muslims who did not agree with his view were just as good as unbelievers. Jihad against pagans is obligatory on Muslim rulers. So if you're a Muslim ruler and you were not conducting jihad against the vast population of pagans or traditional worshippers around you, you were not a good Muslim ruler. And jihad against fellow Muslims who side with pagans is permissible. So again, if you were a Muslim who disagreed and you had friendly relations with, with, with pagans and opposed fighting pagans, then you also uh, become an unbeliever and it's permissible to kill you. And so he invoked the doctrine of takfir. As at this point, takfir was not a, document, a, doc, a doctrine that was known in West Africa, or at least not widespread, or even it was known, it was never used. It was not invoked. Uh, so al Magili introduced these ideas into West African Islam. His views, he was hosted by some rulers in the Songhai Empire and in Kano in the 15th century. And his views, as I said, were later invoked by jihadists in West Africa to propagate jihad. One of those leaders who invoked it was Osman Danfodio, uh, who is the founder of the Sokoto Caliphate. Uh, Osman Danfodio, uh, lived in the early 19th century. He launched his jihad in Hausaland in 1804 against the Hausa rulers, whom he charged with bidah. He charged the rulers of mixing Islam with traditional religious practices, this innovation. And, and largely on the basis of that, he invoked, uh, he launched a jihad against the traditional Hausa rulers, most of whom at this point were Muslim themselves. They had adopted Muslim names, they were practicing Islam, even though they drew legitimacy of their authority from the traditional religions uh, and traditional view. Othman Danfodio himself quotes al Magili extensively in his works. He declared that there should be no friendship, counsel, or living together between an unbeliever and a believer, even if they are blood relations. On the contrary, Believers must bear ill will towards them, that's the unbelievers, and fight them on account of the faith. So Othman Danfodio in the 19th century invoked al Magili's teaching and actually used it to launch a jihad against non-Muslims and fellow Muslims who disagreed with him. And his movement was largely supported by the Fulani. Uh, so it was called the Sokoto Caliphate this Sokoto Caliphate was a European, in fact, a British imposition. And they never called it a caliphate. They call it Daula Usmania. We will come to that, the Ottoman state. But the, this idea of Sokoto Caliphate uh, was a creation by British scholars. In fact, Marie Lass, whom we, we, we quoted at the beginning, was one of those scholars who came up with this uh, uh, description of that uh, historical uh, entity of Ottoman and Furious uh, Jihad that came out of it. The, the Muslims, local Muslims, never called it the Caliphate. Of course, at that time, there was a Caliphate. There was an Ottoman Caliphate. So the term Caliphate was deliberately avoided by the, by the Muslim rulers themselves. It was used by Western scholars to describe it. So this is the Caliphate, and uh, as you can see, occupying then parts of uh, Niger, Burkina, Mali, Nigeria, and even parts of Cameroon. So the Caliphate was quite extensive. One of the scholars who has studied the, the Ottoman and Fodor Jihad is Mervyn Hisket. And this is what Mervyn Hisket says on, uh, on the Jihad. He points out that the brutality and intolerance of militant jihad, especially that of 19th century West Africa, has, in his words, been veiled by an assumption of moral righteousness that leaves no place for an approach from the point of view of the victims. He laments that the absolutism of the jihadists has been in no way diminished 
by the passage of time, and that aspirations for the establishment of the Anfodios model by influential Muslim scholars continue to enjoy widespread support in Nigeria. So this Danfordian tradition, drawing from the Magillian school of thought, he, Mervyn Hisket, who himself is guilty of painting a very glossy picture of the jihad, came now to recant, if you like, and he was now saying that the scholarship that they pioneered has created a situation where many uh, Nigerian Muslim intelligentsia educated Muslims are still invoking the Uthman than Fodus tradition and looking up to it as a model that they have to reintroduce into Nigeria. In Nigeria, Uthman than Fodus is a huge name. He's a revered figure. And so uh, you can understand why scholars would like to uh, link themselves to his work and his, to, to his uh, activities and his views. After Uthman than Fodus, one of the scholars whose views have shaped Islam in Nigeria very profoundly is Abu Bakar Mahmoud Gumi. Uh, and Gumi from the 1940s held himself up as a reformer of Islam in the tradition of Danfodi. He spoke explicitly about this. And he spoke of the golden period of the Sokoto Caliphate and accused the, the emirs of Nigeria of Bida for bringing back to life all the corrupt practices against which Sheikh Danfodio went to war with the former Hausa rulers. So, Sheikh Abu Bakar, uh, Abu Bakar Gumi, what he's saying here is invoking Bidah, just like Danfodio, against the emirs uh, of Nigeria, uh, in the, especially from the 1970s and 80s. He, he set himself, even back from the 1950s, as a reformer. And his teachings inspired the rise of the Yan Izala movement, uh, in Nigeria in the 1970s and the 80s. Uh, and the Yan Izala became very much known for their anti-Sufi, anti-mysticism preaching in Nigeria. Uh, and their preaching against the Qadaria and the Tijaniya Sufi orders led to a lot of bloody confrontations. Uh, and Gumi was at the forefront of that. Uh, so his teaching really brought, uh, intensified the dissent and the protest. Uh, and there's factionalism within Northern Nigerian Islam. Uh, and Gumi was a Salafi, Wahhabi, who had a lot of backing and support from Saudi Arabia for his, for his scholarship and for his work in, in Northern Nigeria. It was in that same context of Gumi, Yan Izala, Tijaniya, uh, Kadaria kind of controversies that we found this uh, guy emerged, Muhammad Marwa, in, 19, in, in the late 1970s, 1980. Uh, and he propounded some teachings that are very similar to what Boko Haram is doing now. Uh, and his name is Maitastin, uh, literally the one who damns or the one who curses. Uh, he imagined Kano with his strong anti-Western and anti-modernity rhetoric, denouncing the use of watches, radios, bicycles, and cars. He declared things Western and modern as bedar and un-Islamic. You see this recurring theme of bedar. So Danfodio is accusing the Hausa rulers of introducing pagan practices into Islam as Bida. Gumi is accusing the Sufis movements of Bida. And Marwa is taking the Bida further to say anything Western, uh, wristwatches, radios, bicycles, and these things are all Bida. Muslims should not be used. So this culture of Bida, of purification, of reforming Islam, is deep rooted in Nigeria. Of course, Marawa himself was killed uh, and uh, his group dispersed. Interestingly, a lot of his followers dispersed to the northeastern part of Nigeria, which is where Boko Haram emerged uh, in, in, the, in the Kanuri area, uh, which is where Boko Haram emerged also uh, in the 2000s. It was again within that same context that a new class, a new generation of, uh, of uh, young Izala students emerged at uh, the Salafi group. This new generation were not happy with the division and the infighting with Muslims. And so they emerged. Uh, most of them were graduates from Saudi Arabia, Medina, uh, and this, these are the Alul Sunnah groups uh, in northern Nigeria. This movement, all the leaders were former uh, members of Yan Izala. Uh, Jafar Adam was one of that such significant leaders of the Salafi movement. Uh, and it was they 
who actually were at the forefront of campaigning for Sharia in northern Nigerian states. Jafar Adam was the teacher of Muhammad Yusuf. Muhammad Yusuf was the founder of Boko Haram. So Jafar Adam was his teacher. Uh, Muhammad Yusuf actually represented Jafar in the 1990s uh, and fell out uh, of favor with him. Uh, and he, he founded his own mosque and his own compound called a mosque called the Ibn Tamir Masjid in Maiduguri uh, around the day around the 2002. And, and they issued a press statement around that time in 2006. Uh, and they, in the press statement, they stated that Islam permits them to subsist under modern Nigerian state, but has explicitly prohibited them from joining or supporting the government insofar as their systems, structures, and institutions contain elements contradictory to core Islamic principles and beliefs. So they are in Nigeria, but they are not of Nigeria. They will not participate in the systems. They, they saw it as Kufu, again, as Bida. And so they set up their own community uh, that they thought they were going to set up a model Islamic community. Jafar, Adam, and Yusuf strongly disagreed with each other. They had polemical exchanges. Uh, Jafar denounced Yusuf, uh, and Jafar himself was gunned down in April 2007, while he was praying in his mosque in Kano on the orders of Yusuf, uh, his own student. So in July 2009, uh, following a confrontation with police, the group, uh, Yusuf's groups by that time were called Boko Haram. Uh, uh, they, they, called, they had a confrontation with the police uh, and their compound was raised down. A lot of people killed. Yusuf himself was captured and later on killed in police custody. Uh, Shakao, uh, assumed leadership and declared an open jihad. So uh, Yusuf was on what you can call a hijra. He, he, he undertook what is called a hijra. He withdrew from the community, from Nigeria system. But it was Muhammad Shekau, uh, Abu Bakar Shekau, who declared the jihad. And it was basically out of the anger of the way the community was attacked and brutally the murder of the brutal murder of Yusuf that drove the group now into this kind of extreme measures uh, led under the leadership of Abu Bakar Shikau. So Abu Bakar Shikau's jihad, according to him himself, uh, he said, we know what is happening. He, he posted a YouTube video uh, in 2014, a very rambling video. And part of it, he says, we know what is happening in this world. It is a jihad war against Christians and Christianity. It is a war against Western education, democracy, and constitution. This is what I know from the Quran. It is war against Christians and democracy and their constitution. Allah says we should finish them when we get them. For him, this was a war, and it was a jihad to purge Nigerian Islam from what he saw as these dangerous, corrupting influences. Christians, Christianity, Western education, democracy, uh, and, and secularism and in general. That was the war he was waging. Again, all of these things were not unique to Yusuf. There were a lot of writers in Niger Northern Nigerian scholars who talked against democracy, who talked against secularism, who talked against Western education. These were themes that were that pre-existed uh, and were very common in Nigerian, even Abu Bakr uh, Gumi himself had talked about some of these themes. But he was not just fighting against, he was also fighting for something in court in Shakao's uh, Boko Haram. Boko Haram was also fighting for the implementation of Sharia, insisting that everyone must follow Sharia. There are no exceptions. Even if you are a Muslim and you don't abide by Sharia, we will kill you. Even if you are my own father, we will kill you. And this is part of the Amos operandi. They declared a, a caliphate uh, in 2014, but as we know, they, 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 they were quickly attacked and they lost the territory uh, in, in, in Guazu area. But after they had killed the emir of Guazu, they also claimed to be fighting for the restoration of the caliphate of Osman and Fodio. And they declared that peace will never reign until when Sharia as a complete way of life is restored 100%, just like the way it was practiced during the period of Daula Usmania. You see, they are using Daula Usmania here. They are not using Sokoto Caliphate. So again, 
they are trying to recreate the Sokoto, the Daula Utmania. So the question is, therefore, where did Boko Haram come from? And this is why I'll conclude and let my sister answer the question for us. Where did Boko Haram come from? A leading Nigerian Muslim scholar who chose to write anonymously traces the origins of Boko Haram as partly from the long-standing negative attitudes towards Western education among the Muslims of Northern Nigeria, and partly from Salafi Wahhabi trends in Nigeria, originating from the preaching career of Sheikh Abubakar Mahmoud Gumi. So he is saying that the context was already there. The ideas were floating, were rife against this suspicion against Western education. And some of the teachers of Abubakar Gumi contributed to creating that kind of atmosphere and context for groups like Boko Haram to, arrive, to, to emerge. So the Sultan of Sokoto described Boko Haram as anti-Islamic and an embarrassment to Islam. The Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia has described Boko Haram as misguided and intent on smearing the name of Islam, while the Grand Ayatollah of Iran has declared Boko Haram as savages who do not deserve to be called human beings. And these are leading Islamists, and they say Boko Haram is not Islamic. But I wait to hear what our sister Jamila has to say on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we appreciate your uh, very concise and well done presentation. If we could get that to our State Department and the, our international journalists in America, that would be very helpful because we would know much more about the situation. But thanks again. So now is my pleasure to um, introduce Professor Yacoub. She's a professor of economics at Lagos State University in Lagos, Nigeria. She um, did her undergraduate degree at the University of Elorian. Um, she did a master's in, at University of Lagos, and she did her PhD in economics from the University of Ibadan in 2010. She's a former Amara or Lady President of the Muslim Students Society of Nigeria, Lagos Area Unit. She's the former Amara uh, President of the Criterion, Lagos District. The Criterion is an association of Muslim women in businesses and professions. It's an international organization with branches in Nigeria and Ghana. We thank you very much for being here today and we look forward to her presentation. Greetings. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I want to appreciate the SANA Institute for giving me the opportunity to share my view on Boko Haram in Nigeria. I want to appreciate John for giving us a profound history of Islamic Renaissance in Nigeria and I want to say that I've learned so much from his presentation. So why we go straight to my own topic, which is looking at the history of Boko Haram in Nigeria, then also looking at the theological foundation of Boko Haram and the ideological basis of Boko Haram. Then I also look at terrorism. Then to what extent can we say Boko Haram is an Islamic group or how can we describe it as a terrorist organization? We'll be able to do that by looking at the activities of Boko Haram. Then I'll come to the concept of jihad in Islam. Then what can we do to mitigate activities such as this being done by Boko Haram? Then conclusion. I want to start by saying Nigeria as a nation has witnessed various forms of conflict and violence. So from what John has presented, violence is not a new thing in Nigeria. And some of these conflicts that we have witnessed, some of them are communal conflicts, some of them are religious, and some are mixed. It will be called religious, but with communal connotation. Some are political, which has been mixed with religion. So it's actually difficult in most cases to separate this conflict as to whether they are communal or religious or political. Sometimes they, are, they will start as a political conflict and along the line, it becomes joined with communal issues and religious issues. So but the essence of what we are saying here is that conflicts in Nigeria are multifaceted and they are caused by many things, including religious differences. While in the North, we have conflict that people always link with religion because Muslims predominate and because of the history of religious violence in the North. So 
violence can easily be termed religion in most cases. But violence is not limited to the north in Nigeria. In the south, south, we have the Maso movement for the actualization of sovereign states of Biafra. We have the IPOB who are seeking secession from Nigeria. We also have in the southwest where we have conflicts of various types. So Boko Haram comes as one of the conflicts that we have in Nigeria. The history, historical origin of Boko Haram, John has given us a lot of background leading to the emergence of Boko Haram. Boko Haram, as we have it today, did not name itself Boko Haram. Rather, it, re it refers to itself as Jamato Alusuno Lidawat Wal Jihad, meaning people committed to the propagation of the prophet teaching and jihad. However, the local people give them the name Boko Haram because to the local people, they see their aversion to Western civilization, Western knowledge, etc. So in other words, even when they say Boko Haram, Boko, as we know, is the corrupted form of the word book. Why Haram means forbidden. So by the explanation of the Boko Haram and even the local people, the concept of Boko Haram is they see anything coming from Western ideology or Western civilization as bringing corruption in the society. And so they have all anything Western. So that's where the word Boko Haram comes from. It is believed that the group was formed in Maiduguri, a town in northwest Nigeria. And the group is also known by other names by the locals. They call them the low Nigerian Taliban, Iswa, Iswa, etc., etc. So as we have contentions about the name, there's also controversies about the origin of Boko Haram. Some believe that the group was formed by Muhammad Yusuf in 2001 or 2002. Other people believe that the group was actually formed as Sahaba in 1995 by one Lawan Abubakar, and that this Lawan Abubakar handed over the group leadership to Muhammad Yusuf when he was going for further studies in Saudi Arabia. Boko Haram, as we have it today, operates in many of the states in northeast Nigeria. And they are coming down to even North Central Nigeria because we have Boko Haram activities in Niger State. Boko Haram does not operate only in Nigeria. They also operate around the Chad Basin in Niger, in Cameroon. And they have caused great havoc in these countries. And Boko Haram, people have classified them into three. The religious Boko Haram, which probably was the origin, the political Boko Haram, then there's a criminal Boko Haram. With this classification, it makes it difficult to really analyze the activities of Boko Haram within religious context alone. So because of this, we need to know what's, what, what's led to the emergence of Boko Haram. Given the history provided by John, one will link Boko Haram with previous religious organizations in the North that were violent, but other scholars have come up with factors or theories that can explain the emergence of Boko Haram. One of such theories is the conspiracy theory. People have said Boko Haram is not just a religious organization, but that there are some Northern politicians who sponsor Boko Haram to make the country ungovernable for Jonathan. Because the activities of Boko Haram came to the light, limelight in 2011, towards the election time and that they were trying to make the country ungovernable for Jonathan by engaging in killings and destruction in the North. But when we look at these arguments, it's self-defeating. The reason is that the North cannot be destroying the North just to prevent a Southerner from becoming president. Still under conspiracy theory, some people believe that it was President Jonathan that actually sponsored Boko Haram to either mobilize support from the South and the Christians or to weaken and depopulate the North ahead of the 2015 election. But this can also not be supported by the confessions of some arrested Boko Haram members. Because those people said, some of them claimed that they were fighting for Islam. Some people said that Boko Haram came up as a symptom of the fact that the Nigerian state has failed or that is failing. But when we look at that concept, a failed state, it may be difficult to describe Nigeria as a failed state. Because Nigeria is doing well in terms of GDP, other countries are not so much better than Nigeria. 
So how will you describe Nigeria as a fair state? Not only that, some other countries that we look up to as advanced states or advanced countries, they also have their own share of violence. For example, the U.S. have its own challenges, New Zealand attacks, South Africa, U.K., they all have this, but we never describe them as a failed state. So why should we use the incidents of Boko Haram to describe Nigeria as a failed state? Still under the conspiracy theory, the human needs and poor governance theory, this seems to bring or have more weight out of all the arguments. Because when we look at how Boko Haram started, it was said that Muhammad Yusuf came up with a mosque of his own. He set up a center, a learning center, where people were given free education. Education may be, quote and unquote, maybe Islamic education. But in addition, he also engaged in welfareism for the people in the community. And that drew many people towards him. Because when people saw that there's somebody that's providing for them, there's the natural tendency for them to move towards such. And that probably made Yusuf and his group to draw many followers in the neighborhood. So the failure of the government to provide for the citizens is one of the key factors that led to the emergence of Boko Haram. This explanation may not be enough. There could be some other arguments that led to the emergence of Boko Haram. Many people are frustrated with the way governance is done in Nigeria. Some people felt marginalized. Some people felt thrown out of the circle of beneficiaries from the Nigerian states. For example, some people that were trained in the traditional Islamic knowledge, they cannot find a position in this new dispensation. Not only that, the North as a body, as a whole, is the most undeveloped part of Nigeria. They, they have the highest level of illiteracy. They have the highest poverty index. This brought a lot of anger and frustration in the people. And they were looking for a way to vent their anger. And this probably provided a better explanation for the emergence of Boko Haram. Because when you look at many of the followers, it's like people that feel, I have nothing to lose, even if I die. So they have felt this uh, enfranchised by the Nigerian states. You see parents willingly releasing their children to be used as suicide bombers. So it tells us that something is wrong with nation building in Nigeria. So Boko Haram can be seen more as a symptom of the crisis in the Nigerian nation building than just a religious organization. So the crisis in the Nigerian nation building has actually led to massive denigerization process. So many people felt that they are not catered for by the Nigerian state. And we cannot leave it to religion. Because if you come down in South South in Nigeria, you see a lot of agitation too, a lot of violence such that it got to a point that the government has to declare some of the organization as terrorist organizations. Some of them have to be proscribed and the argument has been marginalization by the Nigerian states. So the same argument is used to fuel the emergence of Boko Haram in Nigeria. Even though it may have started as a religious organization, but some of these factors led to violence, confrontation of this group with the state. This is not to support violence that is being practiced by the organization, but these are some of the reasons that researchers have come up to justify the existence or the emergence of Boko Haram. What's the ideological or theological roots of Boko Haram? John has given us the fact that Boko Haram came from Salafia, Wahhabism, or wherever. But when you look at the arguments put forward by Boko Haram, they have said, oh, they are radical Islamic movements and they want to fight the non-Muslims, quoting Quranic verses to support what they are doing. But when we look at some of the verses quote said, we discover that it is difficult for any Muslim to rely on such verses to justify violence. For example, if you look at Quran chapter 2, verse 191, that is usually quoted, which says, and kill them wherever you find them, and turn them out from where they have turned you out. This verse 
is quoted in isolation. The discussion started from verse 190. May Allah say, fight in the cause of Allah, those who fight you, but do not transgress the limit, for Allah loveth not the transgressors. Fight in the cause of Allah, those who fight you. That's the first verse. So which means that fighting that is being referred to in verse 191 is actually a command to the Muslims to fight those who fight them. And if you look further in 191, it says, and kill them wherever you find them, referring to those that fought you and turn them out from where they have turned you out. So this fast is actually to fight against those who fight the Muslims. So a Muslim cannot use this fast to start an aggression. So as human beings, people quote just to justify what they want to do, not following the verses that is in the Quran. Because when we look at the way the prophet himself did it, the prophet never started aggression. Read through the history of Islam. The prophet did not start aggression. The first war fought by the prophet was fought very close to Medina, where the prophet ran to after he was persecuted in Mecca. So if he actually wanted to start aggression, he would have stayed back and fight them. But he ran. He ran under the cover of the night to make sure that he was not caught, yet he was chased to Medina. And in order to protect himself and his followers, he has to fight back. And that's what this verse has actually said. So relying on this verse as a basis for starting aggression is definitely not part of Islam. Then the question is, does Islam permit war? Yes, but under very, very strict condition. And the condition is that you have to protect yourself. There are many verses in the Quran. Quran 5, verse 32. It is stated that because of what we have ordained for the children of Israel, that if anyone is killed, if anyone killed a person not in retaliation of murder or spread of mischief in the land, it would be as if he has killed the whole mankind. That is to tell you how sacred life is in Islam. So we have Boko Haram or other groups that are using Quranic verses to justify their unwanted killing of innocent people is actually strange to me. Very, very strange. Because many, many places, Quran 22, verse 39 to 40, talks about fighting. Yet it says, fight those who fight you. So if it is fight against those who fight you, why would Boko Haram go and bomb a village? And also, the argument that if somebody does not tow the line of your own interpretation of the Quran, then you fight them. They have become infidel. The prophet warned against this. There's an adit, a saying of the prophet that says, abusing a Muslim is indecency and fighting him is a sign of disbelief. So if he says this, and what makes one a Muslim is when you say, I believe that Allah is one and the prophet is his messenger. It's not your business about whether that person is sincere with that saying or not. As long as the person says, I am a Muslim, you cannot make the person a disbeliever. You cannot say he has become a disbeliever because he has done one thing or the other. So those arguments that, oh, then where is it in the Quran that says a Muslim should not relate with non-Muslim? How did the prophet live his life in Medina? When he got to Medina, he found Jews, he found Christians there, and he was able to relate well with them. So a lot of violence that we have, interreligious violence or intra-religious violence that we have, is because of other factors besides the religion. People fight for other things. They have issues among themselves. Then they will just use re religious coloration. Now let us look at terrorism. So Quran 5, verse 77 to 81, talk, told us that fighting should be in self-defense. The meaning of jihad Islam is not limited to fighting. A lot of organizations, a lot of Muslims and non-Muslims, they equate jihad with fighting. Whereas jihad means striving, making efforts. 
If it is fighting, how will the Prophet tell us, sallallahu wa sallam, that the greatest jihad is fighting against your self-desire, controlling your self-desire? So if it is fight, physical fight, confrontation, killing, will you kill yourself? So there are many connotations of jihad. Fighting is just one of them. And that is what a lot of Muslims and non-Muslims have interpreted jihad to be. And it, this wrong interpretation has also led to Islamophobia because a lot of non-Muslims, they see Muslims as, oh, violent people. Do we read the history of Islam? How did the Prophet practice it? What about the peaceful Muslims that are on earth? Why do we focus on the few violent Muslims and use it to stereotype all Muslims in the world, leading to Islamophobia? All of us need to check this aspect and focus on issues. Boko Haram, yes, but don't use the, the brush of Boko Haram to paint all Muslims. All Muslims are not the same as Boko Haram. The question is, does Boko Haram represent Islam or are they terrorist organization? So what is terrorism? Terrorism was first coined in 1790 and it was first used during the French Revolution. So which tells us that terrorism does not, does not start with religion. It came from state aggression against state and non-state actors. However, because people can misinterpret or misrepresent terrorism, if you look at the way terrorism is defined, they give it coloration of people who are working against the state who are fighting the state. But actually, the state can also terrorize, as we have in many instances. So terrorism has been defined in different perspectives. But the modern definition of terrorism is controversial because the use of violence for political ends is common to both state and non-state actors. Whereas majority of the definitions we are given by state agencies and they have systematically excluded the governments from definition of terrorism. We have the UN General Assembly with their own definition we have the European Union definition, we have the UK definition, US Patriot Act definition. All these, there is one thing that is common, and that is the calculated use of unlawful violence or threats of unlawful violence to inculcate fear, which is intended to coerce or to intimidate governments or societies in the pursuit of goals that are generally political religious or ideological. You look at all these definitions, the common trend is there's the use of force, either by a state or a non-state actor, on persons to coerce them to behave in a particular way or to maim, to kill, or to destroy properties by violence in order to achieve political, religious, or other goals. So when we look at this definition, we want to ask, how do we classify Boko Haram in these definitions? How do we classify Boko Haram? If you look at the activities of Boko Haram, we have confrontation with the military and the police. We have rape, we have killing, all sorts of violence. And what is the essence? To coerce people to behave in certain way. To coerce people to behave in certain way, to follow certain pattern of thoughts. So given this, you might see that, oh, Boko Haram is doing the line of terrorism based on this. Because if you are forcing people to behave in certain way, then definitely you are terrorists. And if you look at Islam, Islam surely does not support this. Because Islam says there is no compulsion in religion. So if we say there is no compulsion in religion, how can you now say you want to force people to accept Islam? When Allah himself, who gave us Islam, says there's no compulsion in religion. Also, Allah told us in the same Quran that dawah, when you are doing dawah, dawah means to call to the part of Islam. He said it is incumbent on every Muslim to call to the part of Islam, but he gave us a guidance on how to call. He said, invite people to the way of your Lord with wisdom and beautiful admonition and argue with them in a way that is better 
truly your lord knows who has gone astray from his path and he knows best who is rightly guided so if a lad that you say you are calling to is telling you that he knows who is rightly guided and who has gone astray then how is it your own responsibility to guide to force somebody to accept a particular way of thought definitely this is outside islam because islam is saying argue with them in a way that is good call with beautiful admonition so if you are calling with beautiful admonition where is the room for fighting them if they have not fought you there is no room for fighting so if you look at the activities of boko haram as it is today it portrays it as a religion or as a terrorist organization abduction no number of people that have been abducted school children adults many like that forcefully taken away from their homes we are as the prophet said sallallahu alaihi wasallam one of the greatest sin is to kidnap people is to abduct people allah forbids killing innocent people and he said that unless people fight you don't fight them burning of properties burning of people the prophet told us sallallahu alaihi wasallam that you should not burn people that punish you with fire is for god not for individuals so you have no right that somebody does not believe in islam or does not share your view of islam to burn the person even during war islam forbids destruction of people's properties it forbids the destruction of livestock it says don't punish by fire don't destroy places of worship and what do we find boko haram burning churches burning mosques suicide bombing is not allowed you cannot kill yourself is forbidden in islam destroying government properties confronting security personnel creating fears generally among the people farmers can no longer go to their farms children can no longer go to school and we said this is an islamic organization we are as the prophet says even during war don't kill children don't kill women don't kill the elderly don't attack places of worship these places of worship is not referring to mosques synagogues churches in this slides i've shown atrocities committed by boko haram in nigeria so but the misconception that people have i'm going to round up by looking at the misconception about boko haram many people call it islamic organization but many of its activities does not justify this people said it is anti christian but when we look at it they also attack muslims they kill muslims they destroy mosques during jumaat prayer in kano many muslims were killed some people present this argument in order to provoke christians muslim problems because when we keep on presenting it as if it's against christians there will be retaliatory attacks against muslims leading to widespread sectarian conflict in the society and this will destabilize the government more then also some of the attacks attributed to boko haram were actually carried out by some other people non muslims non boko haram members like the case of christians destroying a church and when it was caught people initially said it was boko haram but later through the convention of the person that did it we saw that it was internal wrangling among christians so for us to be able to overcome terrorism in nigeria we need to go to the root we need to address poverty we need to make sure that all part of nigeria are developed governors have to do their work ensure that basic amenities are provided jobs are provided for the people people are taken care of education should be free and quality to be qualitative all this will reduce criminality in the society because the the, the i do hand is the devil's workshop people are drawn into boko haram and other groups because they are poor because they are suffering because they feel marginalized and if the government can address this area then ensure that religious studies is made compulsory in school whether christian or islamic people should be taught the right interpretation of their religion if you leave it to anybody to do they will radicalize the people they will give them wrong interpretation of the religion and that will lead to all this kind of crisis that we have in the society once again i want to thank the institute for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts today and i thank everyone here for listening thank you
Thank you very much. Had a number of questions that have come up in the uh, chat function, and we'll get to those. I do want to introduce one of my colleagues that's here today, uh, Dr. Professor Andrew uh, Andy Knight. He's a Fulbright Scholar at Yale. He's also a Distinguished Chair in International Studies for this year, a one-year appointment at Yale University. So uh, I know he's been very interested in the subject. So Professor Knight, we thank you for your participation in this conversation. So, thank you for uh, having me. Great. Did you want to say anything? No. Well, I just wanted to say that this is um, a very wonderful presentation, provoking. Um, I'm I'm very much interested in the the whole subject of Boko Haram and the uh, you know the, the the kind of navigation that we need to do when we when we deal with an organization like this. Um, so. Uh, I'd be I'd be interested in talking further with both present presenters actually, if they have time, uh, because I, I've been working on a project that deals with um, female suicide bombing, and um, <clears throat> and I think that this may be a way to connect with your group at some point uh, later on. So thank you very much for having me, Michael. Thank you, and uh, Professor Asik. Um, you had some questions. Did you want to ask something, please? Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, you, you phrased your this things, uh, your invitation to. Do you want to ask something? Okay. And so now I have to pretend. I have to pretend that I'm asking something, and I really want to say something. Okay. Want to say something? Uh, yes. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Um, uh, one of the difficulties that I was uh, grappling with uh, in. Uh, in listening to both speakers, but more particularly uh, Professor Yaqub uh, in the end, <clears throat> was a sensitivity to the location of the speaker. Um, <clears throat> and so in this particular case, I, I don't want to be long, here is the speaker. Um, she's a, uh, a Muslim. She's based inside Nigeria, in some ways uh, at the coal face of uh, these debates and so on, and uh, also uh, has the, the things of, uh, she has to in some ways speak for her community, okay? Um, and then there is uh, Professor Azuma, I don't know, I mean, it is uh, in the States at the moment, or is, or is in Nigeria, um, but- um, I'm in Accra. Sorry, you are in Accra. Okay, yeah. sorry, you're in Accra, sorry. Um, okay, so, um, but uh, it takes a more historical view, a long-term view of the question. So, so, I mean, this was really because my way of grappling with it, uh, because, um, yeah, I am in South Africa, generally a safe space for Muslims and other all religious groups and so on. We don't have Islamophobia, we're not battling uh, the image of Muslims, that is it. But at the same time, I mean, as a scholar, <clears throat> I, I have difficulties with the idea of just saying, you know, <clears throat> that uh, Boko Haram is not uh, Islamic. Uh, I would understand if I were a Muslim in Niger in, uh, in uh, Ghana, and I have to, or in Nigeria, and then, you know, if I'm, if I'm talking on radio, I would give a different message. If I'm talking in the academy, I would give a different message. And in, on radio, for example, I would probably downplay the Islamicity of Boko Haram. But I think in a scholarly audience, man, um, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, all the arguments that Boko Haram comes up with these are standard arguments inside the Islamic tradition. And I'm talking now as a product of the traditional uh, theological system I studied in Pakistan in the Taliban-esque uh, institute. So <clears throat> every single argument that Boko Haram comes up with, it is well-founded inside Islamic tradition. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, I don't like the arguments. I think it is a distor. I would describe it as a distortion. But the truth is that the texts are there, and interpretations of the texts are there. And so there are these different contestations. I think of what Islam means. But for me, and I'll finish on this note. But for me, <clears throat> um, 
I, I would want to consider the Boko Haram thing um, in the way in which Professor Yakub tried to look at it in a multifaceted way, but as a theologian and as a scholar of the text, Ishman, I know too much about the tradition of tafsir and the hadith and the contestations about it to just walk away and say, no, 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 these folks, I don't recognize them. I see in them, in, I see in them my tradition. Um, I'm struggling with a new understanding of my tradition, a more liberative, a more distinct one. I'm, I'm struggling with that, yes. Um, but the truth is, folks, I think that these guys have a much easier job just grabbing from the text. We have to engage in all sorts of hermeneutical gymnastics, you know. Anyway, folks, I've spoken too much. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, um, I messed up your, your attempt, uh, Michael, when you said, uh, give us a question, please. <laughs> No, we, we, we always appreciate your insight. So um, would any of our speakers like to respond to Freed's um, statements? In Islam, when you say you believe in Allah and his prophets, you are a Muslim. But it's possible for you to still act contrary to the Islamic teachings. And if you do this, you cannot be removed from the fold of Islam because of your acts. So even the founder of Boko Haram as a group proclaim Islam, most of the members proclaim Islam, we cannot say they are not Muslims. But what the organization is doing is not Islamic. That's what we are saying. That's why we said Boko Haram does not represent Islam. But whether they are Muslims or they are not, once they claim that they are Muslims, we cannot deny them Islam. We cannot deny them Islam. Just like if somebody is Michael and is doing what is wrong, we cannot say because it's Michael, he is representing Christianity in what he's doing. Definitely not. So that's why we need to look at the root. What is pushing people into this? And that is the one we need to address. How can we address it? How can we ensure that people get correct interpretation of Islam? Because most of the time, where this violence normally erupts from are places where poverty is endemic, where ignorance is endemic. So we can actually link them more with poverty and ignorance. For people that have correct understanding of Islam, Islam is so diverse, given even what Farid has just said, subject to different interpretation, but you need to go to the root, which is the Quran. And that is what I think is lacking because many of the Boko Haram members caught, many of them could not even recite the Quran. Some of them do not even know how to pray, which is the commonest thing that a Muslim should know. So how, how can we say these people understand Islam? So it's difficult to say that they actually understand Islam. They are being used by some people to achieve some goals. These goals may not be known to the general member. So thank you. I think the, the only thing I will add is that uh, I think both Prof uh, Isaac and Prof Yakub made a point. And uh, what I want to underscore is the whole question of dissent and debate. If Islam, just like Christianity, there are internal debates, disagreements different interpretations and viewpoints. I think the challenge is how do we handle dissent and debate in our various traditions? And it is when you don't allow the, create the a healthy environment for debate and dissent, that people think the only way to disagree is to denounce and even kill. And that is where the danger is, especially when you come to very loaded theological terms like beda, takfir, and all of those uh, emotive uh, theological terms. And, and I think that's the challenge that Prof. Farid has been, was trying to put his finger to. So I, I think Islam, I, I've always said that I don't think Islam is the problem, uh, but just like other, any, any other religion, I think Islam has a problem. 
And that problem is how do we handle dissent and debate in a healthy way that generates new ideas and generates new insights, feathers, takes knowledge forward, knowledge into our tradition further, rather than just, uh, if we don't agree, we've got to settle it through the barrel of the gun. That is the most dangerous part, I think. Thanks, John. Yes, and, and I was just—I was thinking about during this talk too, just the some of the economic factors that were mentioned um, about kind of the displacement and kind of marginalization of people. But I've also noticed in some of these attacks, people that are marginalized, people that don't have access to wealth or options, are also the ones that are most hurt by these actions. So it's kind of this—you know—people are complaining at once that they, you know, they're they're displaced or they're frustrated by the system, but they actually hurt the people that are also displaced by the system. Um, they're usually the people that are more poor and more vulnerable or hurt. It's not just the powerful. So there are a few other questions here. Um, Dr. Paul, Reverend Dr. Paul, would you like to ask something? Yeah, basically I'm concerned. Um, I really appreciate um, uh, what um, the two speakers have said. Uh, I appreciate even the fact that uh, uh, Jamila has, uh, has responded to one of my questions, but it's all over the place that uh, even within the government of Nigeria, even in the Senate, there are people who are, who are sponsoring Boko Haram and it's known to the government. And the government has been asked to, to, to spot out these people, but because they are sponsoring a particular party, they refuse to fish out the sponsors. And they are perpetrating this thing against all Nigerians, both Muslims and non-Muslims. So what would you say about this? Yeah, I, I think Prof. Jamira has responded to that question uh, in the chat. Uh, I, I, I am not in Nigeria. I don't have the facts on that issue. But uh, just to say generally that I think it will be very irresponsible on the part of a government, any government at all, to want to sponsor uh, such a group to kill its own citizens. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, and one of the things I also know is that, especially in my own little study of Boko Haram, and Prof, uh, Prof Yakub has mentioned this, there is a lot of conspiracy theories. And, and we need to be very careful uh, in, 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 in giving Add time to some of these uh, in case they are just conspiracy theories. Yeah, I, I, I will I will really be skeptical that any government with its name will want to sponsor Boko Haram for because it doesn't make sense. Whatever agenda they, it doesn't just make sense at all. So we have two other questions, two hands raised. We have um, Professor Knight and also Apps. Uh, would you like to ask yours first? Um, I'm I'm curious about the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Boko Haram. Um, I know from the presentations there was some some indication that uh, the Salafist um, ideology has, has has penetrated Boko Haram, uh, but also I think there's a material element here. I I wonder the extent to which uh, Saudi Arabia has been materially supporting the activities of, of Boko Haram. I don't have any evidence to support this, but I think it's one of the theories that people have not been able to substantiate because even in Nigeria, there is also an, a, another argument that they are being supported by French government, that there were cases where French government will come and drop arms for Boko Haram. But how far this is true, I cannot say. So it is difficult for me to accept that or to say it is true that Saudi is supporting yeah, yeah. Boko Haram or not. Thank you, Jamila. Thank you, John. I would like to ask a more practical question. Considering the factors that led to the emergence of Boko Haram, was the West adoption of the hashtag bring back our girls good for the girls? Has the hashtag helped or injured the efforts to free them? And what of Boko Haram's many captives still missing? Thank you very much. This is a very interesting question. First of all, the hashtag has actually created awareness 
about what Boko Haram is doing, especially the abduction of the girls, the Chibo, the Chibo girls and other girls. But the unfortunate thing is that some of these girls, because of the poverty that we're talking about, voluntarily stay behind with Boko Haram. There's a case of a particular girl that was abducted and married off to one of the commanders of Boko Haram. And when the military came to raid the hideout of Boko Haram, this girl was released. And she found her way back to Boko Haram. Eventually, when she came back to her senses and left the Boko Haram group, and she was being interviewed, and she told the family that she went back to Boko Haram because of the financial and the material support she had while married to the Boko Haram commander. And many girls used as suicide bombers. We actually, the parents were actually compensated with material things. That tells us the level of poverty that the people in those areas are going through. So poverty is so, so important in promoting the Boko Haram insurgency. Then whether hashtag movement has actually aided or hindered, I can't say. I can't say. I can't say. Thank you. Thank you very much for this time together. Thank you for your presentations, Dr. Yocum, and also um, John Zuma. We appreciate it. We uh, thank you for all your questions. These will be posted later for others to review. Um, and again, thank you for your participation. We appreciate it. Let's, uh, let's give a big thank you to all our speakers today. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes. next, next month's lecture, the title is going to be on Beyond Jihad, the, the pacifist tradition of Islam in Africa. Uh, so we've talked about, I did allude to two traditions. Uh, next week, we are going to look at the other tradition. Uh, and it will be uh, given, the lecture will be given by one of our Muslim friends, a professor uh, from Senegal who is based in the US. So we're looking out for the, for, the, for the information on that. But thank you once again. And uh, see you next, next month when we see you. God bless. <laughs>